Hi everyone, Mr P again. So we've got chapter two of the magic faraway tree today. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. It was quite a long chapter, but the first chapter in any sort of chapter book and novel, it's called setting the scene. So we need to understand the main characters. We need to understand where the story's set. And also we need to have a bit of an idea that something strange, unusual or surprising might happen. I think that might involve Enchanted Wood. Okay, so this is chapter two. Again, I'm here, just me. If you want to imagine and just leave me speaking in the background, that is fine. Chapter two, first visit to the wood. The three children had no chance to visit the Enchanted Wood until the next week because they had to help their mother and father all they could. There was the garden to get tidy, clothes and kitchen things to be unpacked and put away, and a great deal of cleaning to be done. Sometimes Joe was free and could have gone by himself. Sometimes the girls were sent out for a walk, but Joe was busy. None of them wanted to go without the others, so they had to wait. And then, at last, their chance came. You can have your lunch outdoors today, said Mother. You've worked well, all of you, and you deserve a picnic. I'll cut you some sandwiches and you can take along some nice fresh milk. We'll go to the wood, whispered Beth to the others, and with excited faces and beating hearts, they helped their mother to pack their picnic into a big basket. They set off. There was a small gate at the bottom of their back garden that led into the overgrown lane running by the wood. They unlatched the gate and stood in the lane. They could see the trees in the wood and hear them talk in their strange tea -top, tree talk. Wisha, 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 wisha. I feel as if there are adventures about, said Joe. Come on. Over the ditch we go, and into the enchanted wood. One by one, the children jumped over the narrow ditch. They stood beneath the trees and peered about. Some freckles of sunshine lay here and there on the ground, but not very many, for the trees were so thick. It was dim and green there, and a small bird nearby sang an old, odd little song over and over again. It really is magic, said Franny suddenly. I can feel magic about somewhere. Can't you, Beth? Can you, Joe? Yes, said the others, and their eyes shone with excitement. Come on. They went down a little green path that looked as if it had been made for rabbits. It was so small and narrow. Don't let's go too far, said Joe. We had better wait till we know the paths a bit better before we go deep into the wood. Look about for a place to sit down and have our sandwiches, girls. I can see some wild strawberries, cried Beth, and she knelt down and pressed back some pretty leaves, showing the others deep red strawberries below. Let's pick some and have them with our picnic too, said Franny. So they picked hard and soon had enough to make a fine meal. Let's sit down under that old oak tree over there, said Joe. It's all soft moss under beneath. It'll be like sitting on a green velvet cushion. So they sat down and unpacked their sandwiches. Soon they were munching away happily, listening to the dark green leaves overhead saying, Wisha, wisha, all the time. And it was whilst they were in the middle of their picnic that they saw a very peculiar thing. Franny noticed it first. Not far off was a clear piece of soft grass. As Franny looked at it, she noticed bumps appearing on it. She stared in surprise. The bumps grew. The earth rose up and broke in about six places. Look, said Franny in a low voice, pointing to the piece of grass. What's happening over there? All three of them watched in silence, and then they saw what it was. Six big toadstools were growing quickly up from the ground, pushing their way through and rising up steadily. I've never seen that happen before, said Joe in astonishment. Shh, said Beth. Don't make a noise. I can hear footsteps. The others listened. Sure enough, they heard the sound of pattering feet and little high voices. Let's get behind a bush, quickly, said Beth, suddenly. Whoever it is that is coming will be frightened if they see us. There's magic happening here and we want to see it. They scrambled up and crept quietly behind a thick bush, taking their basket with them. They hid just in time, for even as Beth settled down and patted the leaves of the bush to peep through, there came a troop of small men with long beards almost reaching the ground. Elves, whispered Joe. The elves went to the toadstools and sat down on them. They were holding a meeting. One of them had a bag with which he put down behind his toadstool. The children could not hear what was being said, but they heard the sound of the chattering voices and caught one or two words. Suddenly, Joe nudged Beth and Franny. He 
he had seen something else. The girl saw it too. An ugly, gnome-like fellow was creeping up silently behind the meeting on the toadstools. None of the elves saw him or heard him. He's after that bag, whispered Joe. And so he was. He reached out a long arm. His bony fingers closed on the bag. He began to draw it away under a bush. Joe jumped up. He was not going to watch people being robbed without saying something. He shouted loudly. Stop! Thief! Hey, look at that gnome behind you! In a fright, the elves all leapt up. The gnome jumped to his feet and sped off with the bag. The elves stared after him in dismay, not one of them following him. The robber ran towards the children's bush. He didn't know they were there. As quick as lightning, Joe put his foot out and tripped up the running gnome. Down he went. Crash! The bag flew from his hand, and Beth picked it up and threw it to the astonished elves, who were still standing by the toadstools. Joe tried to grab the gnome, but he was up and off like a bird. The children tore after him. In between the trees they went, dodging here and there, and at last they saw the gnome leap up to the low branches of a giant great tree and pull to himself into the leaves. The children sank down at the bottom, out of breath. We've got him now, said Joe. He can't get down without being caught. Here are the elves coming, said Beth, wiping her hot forehead. The little bearded men ran up and bowed. You are very good to us, said the biggest one. Thank you for saving our bag. We have valuable papers in there. We've got the gnome for you tea, said Joe. Too, said Joe, as he pointed up into the tree. He went up there. If you surround that tree and wait, you'll be able to catch him as he comes down. But the elves would not come too near the tree. They looked half frightened of it. He will not come down until he wants us to, said the biggest elf. That is the oldest and most magic tree in the world. It is the faraway tree. The faraway tree, said Beth, in wonder. What an odd name. Why do you call it that? It's a very strange tree, said the elf. Its top reaches the faraway places in a way we don't understand. Sometimes its top branches may be in witchland, sometimes in lovely countries, sometimes in peculiar places that no one has ever heard of. We never climb it because we never know what might be at the top. How very strange, said the children. The gnome has got into whatever place there is at the top of the tree today, said the biggest elf. He may live there for months and never come down again. It's no good waiting for him, and it's certainly no good going after him. His name is Creepy, because he is forever creeping around quietly. The children looked up into the broad, leafy brows of the tree. They felt tremendously excited. The faraway tree in the enchanted wood. Oh, what magic there seemed to be in the very names. If only we could climb up, said Joe, longingly. You must never do that, said the elves at once. It's dangerous. We must go now, but we do thank you for your help. If ever you want us to help you, just come into the enchanted wood and whistle seven times under the old oak tree, not far from our toadstools. Thank you, said the children, and stared after the six small elves as they ran off between the trees. Joe thought it was time to go home. So they followed the little men down the narrow green path until they came to the part of the wood they knew. They picked up their baskets and went home, all of them thinking the same thought. We must go up the faraway tree and see what is at the top. And that's the end of chapter two, everybody. A couple of strange, interesting characters making an appearance today. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you're able to picture the tree in your head in the woodland and we'll see what happens in chapter 3 tomorrow. Bye.